This is The Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, for the last couple of weeks, Michael Jan and I have been traveling together, two war correspondents traveling around and covering the immigration issue. As you know, it's a huge issue in the United States right now. And uh, it's been a really interesting time traveling with such a storied war correspondent like Michael Yon. If you don't know about Michael, where have you been for the last 20 years? Michael's the, one of the first self-supporting war correspondents out there. Actually, was a real uh, inspiration to me as I was getting started as a, as a war correspondent. Pretty amazing that he's able to uh, do so in such an unencumbered way. Uh, you don't uh, have anybody that you're beholden to. You don't uh, work for a network or anything like that. And I've learned from working for some of those networks that very often they have a, a, spin, a certain spin they want on the story, a certain kind of story that needs to be told. You're free to just tell the truth. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you got into doing this and what uh, what, what the benefit is uh, for the viewers for somebody like you. Right. You know, I got into it uh, through an iterative process. It wasn't a flash of light where I just came up one day and said, let me do crowdsourcing. It wasn't like that at all. Uh, I was in the army, as you know, in special forces. Then I went out, went to school. Then I went to, I was in business for some years. And then I decided I would go into writing. So I began writing books. I wrote, my first book was about going through a uh, special forces uh, Q course as an example and uh, growing up in Florida, which a lot of people like the growing up in Florida and catching alligators, you know, with our hands and that sort of thing type of stories. And, uh, and then uh, I was off in India and that sort of thing, doing the cannibal chasing I've told you about. And then the, you know, the wars took off and uh, two of my friends were killed. Uh, one of my Green Beret friends, Richard Ferguson, uh, was killed in Iraq and Samara. And then the next day, my friend Scott Helvenston, the youngest Navy SEAL, we went to high school together. We used to work out together. He was killed in, uh, in, in, in Iraq, in Fallujah. He was one of the contractors who were murdered and hanged off the bridge. And I went to their funerals. Uh, Scott's funeral was in Florida and Richard Ferguson's funeral was in, Cal was in uh, Colorado. And at Richard's funeral, Green Berets were saying, why don't you go to the war? And at Scott's funeral, SEALs were saying, why don't you go to the war? And, uh, but I didn't do that. That was still April of 2003. And, and then as the year progressed, another friend of mine, Rodney Morris, another high school friend, he was the provost marshal for the first ID. He was up in Tikrit. Rodney said, hey, keep, he kept calling me, why don't you come to the war? That's when I learned what Skype was. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you know, we get into the latter part of 2003, we get into October, they, the, the army started, the military started to do Operation Phantom Freedom, Thunder, uh, Phantom, Phantom Fury. Thunder runs and all that. Yeah, uh, Phantom Fury was the operation in Fallujah. It was okay. the second operation. And that's when I realized, hey, something's wrong here. There's an actual insurgency. And insurgency is something that I've studied quite a lot in special forces, or I've been out with them, for instance, with the Maoist in Nepal, and that's Sort of thing. And so I flew to Iraq in December of 2004. And, uh, and, and then, wow, it, there was a bigger war than I thought. And so as 2000, uh, what was that? 2000? Yeah, 2000, it was two, December 2004. And then as I was there for the next uh, few months, I picked up literally millions of readers very quickly. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, I was willing to do combat. So I did a lot of combat. And but finally, I said, how am I going to finance this thing? This is getting very, I can't afford this. This was costing me about a thousand dollars a day between insurance and employees and that sort of thing. So I said, you know what? I'll put up one of those PayPal buttons and that solved it. So then I had a lot of support from PayPal. One thing a lot of people don't, that, that was after about mm, seven or eight months, I, or I would say something like that. That's when I finally put the PayPal button up, right? And it was successful. And then a lot of people said, oh, you're just doing it for the donations. I was like, mm, no, I wish I were that smart. It was, it was at an afterthought. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't afford it. And so then I went off to Afghanistan and I'll go back to Iraq, Afghanistan, Iraq, Afghanistan, Iraq, Philippines, back to Afghanistan, Iraq. I just stayed in the wars, you know, covered Thai fighting. Yeah, for years you stayed in there. Still do. Uh -huh. And uh, so in reading your dispatches, I guess I realized a couple of things. Number one, there aren't a lot of people that want to do what we do. And that presents an opportunity for guys like us. But number two, it takes a certain, uh, not just inclination, but a certain wherewithal. 
It takes a certain amount of uh, understanding of the arcane nature of war and of the military so that you, when you get off the helicopter, you know which way to run so that you don't walk up to a three-star general and say, what's up, dude? You know, which I've seen happen. Um, and, and because a lot of networks don't have people working for them that understand the, the, that culture, uh, they can't do a good job of telling the truth because they don't understand the difference between a 50 caliber and a 556. They don't understand the difference between a, a BMP and a, and a tank. They, you know, just little things like that that make all the difference when you're being accurate in, in the, reporting the news. So tell me about how you've seen that play out. Yeah, actually, there's a lot. It's not until you've done it for a while and then you've seen people that don't know what they're doing mm -hmm. that you realize we actually learned a lot in the military. You were an Army Ranger. I was a Green Beret. You were a helicopter pilot. So that there is we really know a lot of things during our time in the military that were very helpful. I remember I was doing a Hugh Hewitt interview one time and he said, how much did your Army time help you? And I was like, ah, not that much. But I was wrong. As I thought about that question later, I realized it's huge. And look, you and I, uh, I would say, are probably the two most experienced living American war correspondents. I mean, we're, that are still active. Uh, most of the people that do even a fraction, they end up burned out. I mean, yeah, or even if they end up going to the places that we go, they they just don't have the background in order to really interpret what they're seeing. And I've yeah. seen that so many times in, in Syria, in Afghanistan, where the the interpretation that I hear coming out of the television off of CNN or someplace like that is just so unbelievably wrong. But it's it comes from this ignorance of that arcane nature of the, the culture. And I think people also sort of look at, you know, a couple of old infantry guys and go, you know, well, you guys were just bullet stoppers. I mean, how can you be journalists, right? But, but it is a much more cerebral, especially the Green Berets. It's much more cerebral than people think. And you had to do a lot of studying, a lot of reading, a lot of research, a lot of learning and extraneous schools and that sort of thing. Uh, what, was, what do you think was the, the one thing about the Green Berets that best prepared you for what you do now? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, there's the technical knowledge. For instance, when I was covering TIE fighting, uh, some of it, as you know, when you go into combat, a lot of times you, you hear a lot more than you see, as you well know, right? Mm -hmm. And so there was some night fighting going on in Thailand, in downtown Bangkok. And uh, I was hearing the fighting and I couldn't see it, but I had access to Facebook. So I was actually mm -hmm. saying, you know, they're trained fighters. It's M16. They're firing semi. They're using iron sights. Right mm -hmm. now, people are like, you just said you couldn't see them, but now you're saying they're using iron sights right. and they're actually aiming and they're trained. Mm -hmm. Now, most people would go, OK, th so th what does the blind man see now? But if you know much about combat and you've done combat enough and you fired an M16 enough, mm -hmm. you very well know you can tell the cadence. You yes. can you can tell when they go into automatic fire, if it's if they're trained or not. You can tell if they're panicking. You can tell if they're well led. Mm -hmm. You can tell a lot of things just by closing your eyes and listening. Yeah, right? that's right. But you can only do that if you've really been out a lot doing the yeah. thing. Right. And if you led troops yourself, you know, you understand that when the when you see tracer rounds going straight up in the air, those guys are just hiding in their holes and shooting like this without watching where they're shooting uh, and s stuff like that. The other thing that I've noticed that I think is kind of funny is kind of the opposite of that. When the I'm in a scrum of journalists in Afghanistan or someplace, and there you hear a shot fired, and you hear, you know, or a you hear a a, a controlled debt, you know, controlled detonation go off somewhere. They find elect uh, explosives someplace and they put them in a big pile out in the desert and they blow them up. Um, we know the difference of what that sounds like. The other journalists don't. So something like a controlled detonation goes off. All the other journalists hit the dirt. And you're, you're the only one standing there looking around going, you guys look like morons right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, but yeah. so it, it does take a, a, a certain level of experience that, that just can't be replicated. It can't be taught. It has to be lived. And, yeah. and, you've and there's other that. times when we're hitting the dirt that's, and they're still standing. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Without a tight leg. Like, you know the difference between a round that's close and a round that's far away. That round that just snapped right by your ear. Yeah. Well, so um, let's segue into what we've been reporting on now, this immigration crisis. Right. Um, you know, we've learned a lot over the last couple of weeks. We have. Traveling from uh, the Mexican border down into Colombia and now into Panama. Uh, tell me what the biggest takeaways have been for you. You've been extremely helpful. First of all, we were up in Washington, D.C. together. Oh, yeah, that's right. And, uh, and then, you know, I was at the Capitol attack and then 
did not go inside, of course. And then at the inauguration, we saw him put that wall up. And then you're like, let's get to Texas. Mm -hmm. Jumped on the airplane, went to El Paso. And then that's when you're, your 20 years or so of studying the immigration and Todd Bensman as well, your friend. I mean, it's been highly educational for me. And uh, going into uh, Juarez, of course, going to the hotels, talking with people there. Uh, I've been learning a, a huge amount. Of course, you and I both have seen border regions around the world, whether it's Thailand and Myanmar or, oh, so many, so many. Uh, and, and, you know, we were just talking tonight about how uh, so many of the issues in borders around the world are so similar. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2021.